Volume two, part two, chapter twenty nine of the ingenious gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra, translated by John Ormsby, eighteen twenty nine to eighteen ninety five. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Volume two, part two, chapter twenty nine of the famous adventure of the enchanted bark by stages as already described or left undescribed two days after quitting the grove don quixote and sancho reached the river ebro and the sight of it was a great delight to don quixote as he contemplated and gazed upon the charms of its banks the clearness of its stream the gentleness of its current and the abundance of its crystal waters and the pleasant view revived a thousand tender thoughts in his mind above all he dwelt upon what he had seen in the cave of montesinos for though master pedro's ape had told him that of those things part was true part false he clung more to their truth than to their falsehood the very reverse of sancho who held them all to be downright lies as they were thus proceeding then they discovered a small boat without oars or any other gear that lay at the water's edge tied to the stem of a tree growing on the bank don quixote looked all round and seeing nobody at once without more ado dismounted from rocinante and bade sancho get down from dapple and tie both beasts securely to the trunk of a poplar or willow that stood there sancho asked him the reason of this sudden dismounting and tying don quixote made answer thou must know sancho that this bark is plainly and without the possibility of any alternative calling and inviting me to enter it and in it go to give aid to some knight or other person of distinction in need of it who is no doubt in some sore strait but this is the way of the books of chivalry and of the enchanters who figure and speak in them when a knight is involved in some difficulty from which he cannot be delivered save by the hand of another knight though they may be at a distance of two or three thousand leagues or more one from the other they either take him up on a cloud or they provide a bark for him to get into and in less than the twinkling of an eye they carry him where they will and where his help is required and so sancho this bark is placed here for the same purpose this is as true as that it is now day and ere this one passes tie dapple and rocinante together and then in god's hand be it to guide us for i would not hold back from embarking though barefooted friars were to beg me as that's the case said sancho and your worship chooses to give in to these uh, i don't know if i may call them absurdities at every turn there's nothing for it but to obey and bow the head bearing in mind the proverb do as thy master bids thee and sit down to table with him but for all that for the sake of easing my conscience i warn your worship that it is my opinion this bark is no enchanted one but belongs to some of the fishermen of the river for they catch the best shad in the world here as sancho said this he tied the beasts leaving them to the care and protection of the enchanters with sorrow enough in his heart don quixote bade him not to be uneasy about deserting the animals for he who would carry themselves over such longinquous roads and regions would take care to feed them i don't understand that logi cuis said sancho nor have i ever heard the word all the days of my life longinquous replied don quixote means far off but it is no wonder thou dost not understand it for thou art not bound to know latin like some who pretend to know it and don't now they are tied said sancho what are we to do next what said don quixote cross ourselves and weigh anchor i mean embark and cut the moorings by which the bark is held and the bark began to drift away slowly from the bank but when sancho saw himself somewhere about two yards out in the river he began to tremble and give himself up for lost but nothing distressed him more than hearing dapple bray and seeing rocinante struggling to get loose and said he to his master dapple is braying in grief at our leaving him and rocinante is trying to escape and plunge in after us o oh, dear friends peace be with you and may this madness that is taking us away from you turned into sober sense bring us back to you and with this he fell weeping so bitterly that don quixote said to him sharply and angrily what art thou afraid of cowardly creature what art thou weeping at heart of butter paste who pursues or molests thee thou soul of a tame mouse what dost thou want unsatisfied in the very heart of abundance art thou perchance tramping barefoot over the riphian mountains 
instead of being seated on a bench like an archduke on the tranquil stream of this pleasant river from which in a short space we shall come out upon the broad sea but we must have already emerged and gone seven hundred or eight hundred leagues and if i had here an astrolabe to take the altitude of the pole i could tell thee how many we have travelled though either i know little or we have already crossed or shall shortly cross the equinoctial line which parts the two opposite poles midway and when we come to that line your worship speaks of said sancho how far shall we have gone very far said don quixote for of the three hundred and sixty degrees that this terraqueous globe contains as computed by ptolemy the greatest cosmographer known we shall have travelled one half when we come to the line i spoke of by god said sancho your worship gives me a nice authority for what you say putrid dolly something transmogrified or whatever it is don quixote laughed at the interpretation sancho put upon computed and the name of the cosmographer ptolemy and said he thou must know sancho that with the spaniards and those who embark at cadiz for the east indies one of the signs they have to show them when they have passed the equinoctial line i told thee of is that the lice die upon everybody on board the ship and not a single one is left or to be found in the whole vessel if they gave its weight in gold for it so sancho thou mayest as well pass thy hand down thy thigh and if thou comest upon anything alive we shall no longer be in any doubt if not then we have crossed i don't believe a word of it said sancho still i'll do as your worship bids me though i don't know what need there is for trying these experiments for i can see with my own eyes that we have not moved five hundred yards away from the bank or shifted two yards from where the animals stand for there are rocinante and dapple in the very same place where we left them and watching a point as i do now i swear by all that's good we are not stirring or moving at the pace of an ant try the test i told thee of sancho said don quixote and don't mind any other for thou knowest nothing about colours lines parallels zodiacs ecliptics poles solstices equinoxes planets signs bearings the measures of which the celestial and terrestrial spheres are composed if thou wert acquainted with all these things or any portion of them thou wouldst see clearly how many parallels we have cut what signs we have seen and what constellations we have left behind and are now leaving behind but again i tell thee feel and hunt for i am certain thou art cleaner than a sheet of smooth white paper sancho felt and passing his hand gently and carefully down to the hollow of his left knee he looked up at his master and said either the test is a false one or we have not come to where your worship says nor within many leagues of it why how so asked don quixote hast thou come upon aught ay and aughts replied sancho and taking his fingers he washed his whole hand in the river along which the boat was quietly gliding in midstream not moved by any occult intelligence or invisible enchanter but simply by the current just there smooth and gentle they now came in sight of some large water-mills that stood in the middle of the river and the instant don quixote saw them he cried out seest thou there my friend there stands the castle or fortress where there is no doubt some knight endurance or ill-used queen or infanta or princess in whose aid i am brought hither what the devil city fortress or castle is your worship talking about senor said sancho don't you see that those are mills that stand in the river to grind corn hold thy peace sancho said don quixote though they look like mills they are not so i have already told thee that enchantments transform things and change their proper shapes i do not mean to say they really change them from one form into another but that it seems as though they did as experience proved in the transformation of dulcinea sole refuge of my hopes by this time the boat having reached the middle of the stream began to move less slowly than hitherto the millers belonging to the mills when they saw the boat coming down the river and on the point of being sucked in by the draught of the wheels ran out in haste several of them with long poles to stop it and being all mealy with faces and garments covered with flour they presented a sinister appearance they raised loud shouts crying devils of men where are you going to are you mad do you want to drown yourselves or dash yourselves to pieces among these wheels did i not tell thee sancho said don quixote at this that we had reached the place where i am to show what the might of my arm can do see what ruffians and villains come out against me see what monsters oppose me see what hideous countenances come to frighten us you shall soon see scoundrels 
and then standing up in the boat he began in a loud voice to hurl threats at the millers exclaiming ill-conditioned and worse counselled rabble restore to liberty and freedom the person you hold in durance in this your fortress or prison high or low or of whatever rank or quality he be for i am don quixote of la mancha otherwise called the knight of the lions for whom by the disposition of heaven above it is reserved to give a happy issue to this adventure and so saying he drew his sword and began making passes in the air at the millers who hearing but not understanding all this nonsense strove to stop the boat which was now getting into the rushing channel of the wheels sancho fell upon his knees devoutly appealing to heaven to deliver him from such imminent peril which it did by the activity and quickness of the millers who pushing against the boat with their poles stopped it not however without upsetting and throwing don quixote and sancho into the water and lucky it was for don quixote that he could swim like a goose though the weight of his armour carried him twice to the bottom and had it not been for the millers who plunged in and hoisted them both out it would have been troy town with a pair of them as soon as more drenched than thirsty they were landed sancho went down on his knees and with clasped hands and eyes raised to heaven prayed a long and fervent prayer to god to deliver him evermore from the rash projects and attempts of his master the fishermen the owners of the boat which the mill-wheels had knocked to pieces now came up and seeing it smashed they proceeded to strip sancho and to demand payment for it from don quixote but he with great calmness just as if nothing had happened him told the millers and fishermen that he would pay for the bark most cheerfully on condition that they delivered up to him free and unhurt the person or persons that were in durance in that castle of theirs what persons or what castle art thou talking of madman art thou for carrying off the people who come to grind corn in these mills that's enough said don quixote to himself it would be preaching in the desert to attempt by entreaties to induce this rabble to do any virtuous action in this adventure two mighty enchanters must have encountered one another and one frustrates what the other attempts one provided the bark for me and the other upset me god help us this world is all machinations and schemes at cross purposes one with the other i can do no more and then turning towards the mills he said aloud friends whoe'er ye be that are immured in that prison forgive me that to my misfortune and yours i cannot deliver you from your misery this adventure is doubtless reserved and destined for some other night so saying he settled with the fishermen and paid fifty reals for the boat which sancho handed to them very much against the grain saying with a couple more bark businesses like this we shall have sunk our whole capital the fishermen and the millers stood staring in amazement at the two figures so very different to all appearance from ordinary men and were wholly unable to make out the drift of the observations and questions don quixote addressed to them and coming to the conclusion that they were madmen they left them and betook themselves the millers to their mills and the fishermen to their huts don quixote and sancho returned to their beasts and to their life of beasts and so ended the adventure of the enchanted bark end of volume two part two chapter twenty nine recording by expatriate in bangor maine volume two part two chapter thirty of the ingenious gentleman don quixote of la mancha by miguel de cervantes saavedra translated by john ormsby eighteen twenty nine to eighteen ninety five this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine volume two part two chapter thirty of don quixote's adventure with a fair huntress they reached their beasts in low spirits and bad humour enough knight and squire sancho particularly for with him what touched the stock of money touched his heart and when any was taken from him he felt as if he was robbed of the apples of his eyes in fine without exchanging a word they mounted and quitted the famous river don quixote absorbed in thoughts of his love sancho in thinking of his advancement which just then it seemed to him he was very far from securing for fool as he was he saw clearly enough that his master's acts were all or most of them utterly senseless and he began to cast about for an opportunity of retiring from his service and going home some day 
without entering into any explanations or taking any farewell of him. Fortune, however, ordered matters after a fashion very much the opposite of what he contemplated. It so happened that the next day towards sunset, on coming out of a wood, Don Quixote cast his eyes over a green meadow, and at the far end of it observed some people, and as he drew nearer saw that it was a hawking party. Coming closer, he distinguished among them a lady of graceful mien, on a pure white palfrey or hackney, caparisoned with green trappings, and a silver-mounted side-saddle. The lady was also in green, and so richly and splendidly dressed that splendor itself seemed personified in her. On her left hand she bore a hawk, a proof to Don Quixote's mind that she must be some great lady and the mistress of the whole hunting party, which was the fact. So he said to Sancho, Run, Sancho, my son, and say to that lady on the palfrey with the hawk that I, the knight of the lions, kiss the hands of her exalted beauty, and if her excellence will grant me leave, I will go and kiss them in person, and place myself at her service for aught that may be in my power, and her highness may command, and mind, Sancho, how thou speakest and take care not to thrust in any of thy proverbs into thy message. You've got a likely one here to thrust any in, said Sancho. Leave me alone for that. Why, this is not the first time in my life I have carried messages to high and exalted ladies. Except that thou didst carry to the lady Dulcinea, said Don Quixote, I know not that thou hast carried any other, at least in my service. That is true, replied Sancho. But pledges don't distress a good payer, and in a house where there's plenty, supper is soon cooked. I mean, there's no need of telling or warning me about anything, for I'm ready for everything and know a little of everything. That I believe, Sancho, said Don Quixote. Go, and good luck to thee, and God speed thee. Sancho went off at top speed, forcing Dapple out of his regular pace, and came to where the fair huntress was standing, and dismounting knelt before her and said, Fair lady, that knight that you see there, the knight of the lions by name, is my master, and I am a squire of his, and at home they call me Sancho Panza. The same knight of the lions, who was called not long since the knight of the rueful countenance, sends by me to say, may it please your highness to give him leave, that with your permission, approbation, and consent, he may come and carry out his wishes, which are, as he says, and I believe, to serve your exalted loftiness and beauty. And if you give it, your ladyship will do a thing which will redound to your honour, and he will receive a most distinguished favour and happiness. You have indeed, squire, said the lady, delivered your message with all the formalities such messages require. Rise up, for it is not right that the squire of a knight so great as he of the rueful countenance, of whom we have heard a great deal here, should remain on his knees. Rise, my friend, and bid your master welcome to the services of myself and the duke my husband, in a country house we have here. Sancho got up, charmed as much by the beauty of the good lady as by her high-bred air and her courtesy, but above all by what she had said about having heard of his master, the Knight of the Rueful Countenance. For if she did not call him Knight of the Lions, it was no doubt because he had so lately taken the name. Tell me, brother squire, asked the Duchess, whose title, however, is not known. This master of yours, is he not one of whom there is a history extant in print called the ingenious gentleman don quixote of la mancha who has for the lady of his heart a certain dulcinea del toboso he is the same senora replied sancho and that squire of his who figures or ought to figure in the said history under the name of sancho panza is myself unless they have changed me in the cradle i mean in the press i am rejoiced at all this said the duchess go brother panza and tell your master that he is welcome to my estate, and that nothing could happen to me that could give me greater pleasure. Sancho returned to his master mightily pleased with this gratifying answer, and told him all the great lady had said to him, lauding to the skies in his rustic phrase her rare beauty, her graceful gaiety, and her courtesy. Don Quixote drew himself up briskly in his saddle, fixed himself in his stirrups, settled his visor, gave Rocinante the spur, and with an easy bearing advanced to kiss the hands of the duchess, who, having sent to summon the duke her husband, told him while Don Quixote was approaching all about the message. And as both of them had read the first part of this history, and from it were aware of Don Quixote's crazy turn, they awaited him with the greatest delight and anxiety to make his acquaintance, meaning to fall in with his humor and agree with everything he said, and, so long as he stayed with them, to treat him as a knight-errant, 
with all the ceremonies usual in the books of chivalry they had read for they themselves were very fond of them don quixote now came up with his visor raised and as he seemed about to dismount sancho made haste to go and hold his stirrup for him but in getting down off dapple he was so unlucky as to hitch his foot in one of the ropes of the pack saddle in such a way that he was unable to free it and was left hanging by it with his face and breast on the ground don quixote who was not used to dismount without having the stirrup held fancying that sancho had by this time come to hold it for him threw himself off with a lurch and brought rocinante's saddle after him which was no doubt badly girthed and saddle and he both came to the ground not without discomfiture to him and abundant curses muttered between his teeth against the unlucky sancho who had his foot still in the shackles the duke ordered his huntsman to go to the help of knight and squire and they raised don quixote sorely shaken by his fall and he limping advanced as best he could to kneel before the noble pair this however the duke would by no means permit on the contrary dismounting from his horse he went and embraced don quixote saying i am grieved sir knight of the rueful countenance that your first experience on my ground should have been such an unfortunate one as we have seen but the carelessness of squires is often the cause of worse accidents that which has happened me in meeting you mighty prince replied don quixote cannot be unfortunate even if my fall had not stopped short of the depths of the bottomless pit for the glory of having seen you would have lifted me up and delivered me from it my squire god's curse upon him is better at unloosing his tongue in talking impertinence than in tightening the girths of a saddle to keep it steady but however i may be fallen or raised up on foot or on horseback i shall always be at your service and that of my lady the duchess your worthy consort worthy queen of beauty and paramount princess of courtesy gently senor don quixote of la mancha said the duke where my lady doña dulcinea del toboso is it is not right that other beauties should be praised sancho by this time released from his entanglement was standing by and before his master could answer he said there is no denying and it must be maintained that my lady dulcinea del toboso is very beautiful but the hair jumps up where one least expects it and i have heard say that what we call nature is like a potter that makes vessels of clay and he who makes one fair vessel can as well make two or three or a hundred i say so because by my faith my lady the duchess is in no way behind my mistress the lady dulcinea del toboso don quixote turned to the duchess and said your highness may conceive that never had knight-errant in this world a more talkative or a droller squire than i have and he will prove the truth of what i say if your highness is pleased to accept of my services for a few days to which the duchess made answer that worthy sancho is droll i consider a very good thing because it is a sign that he is shrewd for drollery and sprightliness senor don quixote as you very well know do not take up their abode with dull wits and as good sancho is droll and sprightly i here set him down as shrewd and talkative added don quixote so much the better said the duke for many droll things cannot be said in few words but not to lose time in talking come great knight of the rueful countenance of the lions your highness must say said sancho for there is no rueful countenance nor any such character now he of the lions be it continued the duke i say let sir knight of the lions come to a castle of mine close by where he shall be given that reception which is due to so exalted a personage and which the duchess and i are wont to give to all knights-errant who come there by this time sancho had fixed and girthed rocinante's saddle and don quixote having got on his back and the duke mounted a fine horse they placed the duchess in the middle and set out for the castle the duchess desired sancho to come to her side for she found infinite enjoyment in listening to his shrewd remarks sancho required no pressing but pushed himself in between them and the duke who thought it rare good fortune to receive such a knight-errant and such a homely squire in their castle. End of volume two, part two, chapter thirty. Recording by expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Volume two, part two, chapter thirty one of the ingenious gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra. Translated by John Ormsby. 1829 to 1895. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Volume 2, Part 2, Chapter 31 which treats of many and great matters. Supreme was the satisfaction that Sancho felt at seeing himself, as it seemed, an established favourite with the Duchess, for he looked forward to finding in her castle what he had found in Don Diego's house and in Basilio's. He was always fond of good living, and always seized by the forelock any opportunity of feasting himself whenever it presented itself. The history informs us, then, that before they reached the country house or castle, the duke went on in advance and instructed all his servants how they were to treat don quixote and so the instant he came up to the castle gates with the duchess two lackeys or equerries clad in what they call morning gowns of fine crimson satin reaching to their feet hastened out and catching don quixote in their arms before he saw or heard them said to him your highness should go and take my lady the duchess off her horse don quixote obeyed and great bandying of compliments followed between the two over the matter but in the end the duchess's determination carried the day and she refused to get down or dismount from her palfrey except in the arms of the duke saying she did not consider herself worthy to impose so unnecessary a burden on so great a knight at length the duke came out to take her down and as they entered a spacious court two fair damsels came forward and threw over don quixote's shoulders a large mantle of the finest scarlet cloth and at the same instant all the galleries of the court were lined with the men servants and women servants of the household crying welcome flower and cream of knight errantry while all or most of them flung pellets filled with scented water over don quixote and the duke and duchess at all which don quixote was greatly astonished and this was the first time that he thoroughly felt and believed himself to be a knight errant in reality and not merely in fancy now that he saw himself treated in the same way as he had read of such knights being treated in days of yore sancho deserting dapple hung on to the duchess and entered the castle but feeling some twinges of conscience at having left the ass alone he approached a respectable duenna who had come out with the rest to receive the duchess and in a low voice he said to her senora gonzalez or however your grace may be called i am called doña rodriguez de grijalba replied the duenna what is your will brother to which sancho made answer i should be glad if your worship would do me the favour to go out to the castle gate where you will find a grey ass of mine make them if you please put him in the stable or put him there yourself for the poor little beast is rather easily frightened and cannot bear being alone at all if the master is as wise as the man said duenna we have got a fine bargain be off with you brother and bad luck to you and him who brought you here go look after your ass for we the duennas of this house are not used to work of that sort well then in troth returned sancho i have heard my master who is the very treasure finder of stories telling the story of lancelot when he came from britain say that ladies waited upon him and duennas upon his hack and if it comes to my ass i wouldn't change it for senor lancelot's hack if you are a jester brother said the duenna keep your drolleries for some place where they'll pass muster and be paid for for you'll get nothing from me but a fig at any rate it will be a very ripe one said sancho for you won't lose the trick in years by a point too little son of a bitch said the duenna all aglow with anger whether i'm old or not it's with god i have to reckon not with you you garlic stuffed scoundrel and she said it so loud that the duchess heard it and turning round and seeing the duenna in such a state of excitement and her eyes flaming so asked whom she was wrangling with with this good fellow here said the duenna who has particularly requested me to go and put an ass of his that is at the castle gate into the stable holding it up to me as an example that they did the same i don't know where that some ladies waited on one lancelot and duennas on his hack and what is more to wind up with he called me old that said the duchess i should have considered the greatest affront that could be offered me and addressing sancho she said to him you must know friend sancho that doña rodriguez is very youthful and that she wears that hood more for authority and custom's sake than because of her years may all the rest of mine be unlucky said sancho if i meant it that way i only spoke because the affection i have for my ass is so great and i thought i could not commend him to a more kind-hearted person than the lady doña rodriguez don quixote who was listening said to him is this proper conversation for the place sancho 
Señor, replied Sancho, every one must mention what he wants, wherever he may be. I thought of Dapple here, and I spoke of him here. If I had thought of him in the stable, I would have spoken there. On which the duke observed, Sancho is quite right, and there is no reason at all to find fault with him. Dapple shall be fed to his heart's content, and Sancho may rest easy, for he shall be treated like himself. While this conversation, amusing to all except Don Quixote, was proceeding, they ascended the staircase and ushered Don Quixote into a chamber, hung with rich cloth of gold and brocade. Six damsels relieved him of his armor, and waited on him like pages, all of them prepared and instructed by the duke and duchess as to what they were to do, and how they were to treat Don Quixote, so that he might see and believe they were treating him like a knight-errant. When his armor was removed, there stood Don Quixote, in his tight-fitting breeches and chamois doublet, lean, lanky, and long, with cheeks that seemed to be kissing each other inside, such a figure that if the damsels waiting on him had not taken care to check their merriment, which was one of the particular directions their master and mistress had given them, they would have burst with laughter. They asked him to let himself be stripped that they might put a shirt on him, but he would not on any account, saying that modesty became knights errant just as much as valor. However, he said they might give the shirt to Sancho, and shutting himself in with him in a room where there was a sumptuous bed, he undressed and put on the shirt. And then, finding himself alone with Sancho, he said to him, Tell me, thou new-fledged buffoon and old booby, dost thou think it right to offend and insult a duenna so deserving of reverence and respect as that one just now? Was that a time to bethink thee of thy dapple? Or are these noble personages likely to let the beasts fare badly when they treat their owners in such elegant style? For God's sake, Sancho, restrain thyself, and don't show the thread so as to let them see what a coarse, boorish texture thou art of remember sinner that thou art the master is the more esteemed the more respectable and well-bred his servants are and that one of the greatest advantages that princes have over other men is that they have servants as good as themselves to wait on them dost thou not see short-sighted being that thou art an unlucky mortal that i am that if they perceive thee to be a coarse clown or a dull blockhead they will suspect me to be some impostor or swindler Nay, nay, Sancho friend, keep clear, oh, keep clear of these stumbling blocks, for he who falls into the way of being a chatterbox and droll drops into a wretched buffoon the first time he trips. Bridle thy tongue, consider and weigh thy words before they escape thy mouth, and bear in mind we are now in quarters whence, by God's help and the strength of my arm, we shall come forth mightily advanced in fame and fortune. Sancho promised him with much earnestness to keep his mouth shut, and to bite off his tongue before he uttered a word that was not altogether to the purpose and well considered and told him he might make his mind easy on that point for it should never be discovered through him what they were don quixote dressed himself put on his baldric with his sword threw the scarlet mantle over his shoulders placed on his head a montera of green satin that the damsels had given him and thus arrayed passed out into the large room where he found the damsels drawn up in double file the same number on each side with all the appliances for washing the hands which they presented to him with profuse obeisances and ceremonies then came twelve pages together with the seneschal to lead him to dinner as his hosts were already waiting for him they placed him in the midst of them and with much pomp and stateliness they conducted him into another room where there was a sumptuous table laid with but four covers the duchess and the duke came out to the door of the room to receive him and with him a grave ecclesiastic, one of those who rule noblemen's houses, one of those who, not being born magnates themselves, never know how to teach those who are how to behave as such, one of those who would have the greatness of great folk measured by their own narrowness of mind, one of those who, when they try to introduce economy into the household they rule, lead it into meanness. One of this sort, I say, must have been the grave churchman who came out with the duke and duchess to receive don quixote a vast number of polite speeches were exchanged and at length taking don quixote between them they proceeded to sit down to table the duke pressed don quixote to take the head of the table and though he refused the entreaties of the duke were so urgent that he had to accept it the ecclesiastic took his seat opposite to him and the duke and duchess those at the sides all this time sancho stood by 
gaping with amazement at the honour he saw shown to his master by these illustrious persons and observing all the ceremonious pressing that had passed between the duke and don quixote to induce him to take his seat at the head of the table he said if your worship will give me leave i will tell you a story of what happened in my village about this matter of seats the moment sancho said this don quixote trembled making sure that he was about to say something foolish sancho glanced at him and guessing his thoughts said don't be afraid of my going astray senor or saying anything that won't be pat to the purpose i haven't forgotten the advice your worship gave me just now about talking much or little well or ill i have no recollection of anything sancho said don quixote say what thou wilt only say it quickly well then said sancho what i am going to say is so true that my master don quixote who is here present will keep me from lying lie as much as thou wilt for all i care sancho said don quixote for i am not going to stop thee but consider what thou art going to say i have so considered and reconsidered said sancho that the bell ringers in a safe berth as will be seen by what follows it would be well said don quixote if your highnesses would order them to turn out this idiot for he will talk a heap of nonsense by the life of the duke sancho shall not be taken away from me for a moment said the duchess i am very fond of him for i know he is very discreet discreet be the days of your holiness said sancho for the good opinion you have of my wit though there is none in me but the story i want to tell is this there was an invitation given by a gentleman of my town a very rich one and one of quality for he was one of the alamos of medina del campo and married to doña mencia de quinones the daughter of don alonso de maranon knight of the order of santiago that was drowned in the herradura him there was that quarrel about years ago in our village that my master don quixote was mixed up in to the best of my belief that tomasillo the scapegrace the son of balbastro the smith was wounded in isn't all this true master mine as you live say so that these gentlefolk may not take me for some lying chatterer so far said the ecclesiastic i take you to be more a chatterer than a liar but i don't know what i shall take you for by and by thou citest so many witnesses and proofs sancho said don quixote that i have no choice but to say thou must be telling the truth go on and cut the story short for thou art taking the way not to make an end for two days to come he is not to cut it short said the duchess on the contrary for my gratification he is to tell it as he knows it though he should not finish it these six days and if he took so many they would be to me the pleasantest i ever spent well then sirs i say continued sancho that this same gentleman whom i know as well as i do my own hands for if not a bowshot from my house to his invited a poor but respectable labourer get on brother said the churchman at the rate you are going you will not stop with your story short of the next world i'll stop less than half way please god said sancho and so i say this labourer coming to the house of the gentleman i spoke of that invited him rest his soul he is now dead and more by token he died the death of an angel so they say for i was not there for just at that time i had gone to reap at Temblake. as you live my son said the churchman make haste back from Temblake and finish your story without burying the gentleman unless you want to make more funerals well then it so happened said sancho that as the pair of them were going to sit down to table and i think i can see them now plainer than ever great was the enjoyment the duke and duchess derived from the irritation the worthy churchman showed at the long-winded halting way sancho had of telling his story while don quixote was chafing with rage and vexation so as i was saying continued sancho as the pair of them were going to sit down to table as i said the labourer insisted upon the gentleman taking the head of the table and the gentleman insisted upon the labourer's taking it as his orders should be obeyed in his house but the labourer who plumed himself on his politeness and good breeding would not on any account until the gentleman out of patience putting his hands on his shoulders compelled him by force to sit down saying sit down you stupid lout for wherever i sit will be the head to you and that's the story in troth i think it hasn't been brought in amiss here don quixote turned all colours which on his sunburnt face mottled it till it looked like jasper the duke and duchess suppressed their laughter so as not altogether to mortify don quixote for they saw through sancho's impertinence and to change the conversation and keep sancho from uttering more absurdities the duchess asked don quixote what news he had of the lady dulcinea 
and if he had sent her any presents of giants or miscreants lately for he could not but have vanquished a good many to which don quixote replied senora my misfortunes though they had a beginning will never have an end i have vanquished giants and i have sent her caitiffs and miscreants but where are they to find her if she is enchanted and turned into the most ill-favoured peasant wench that can be imagined i don't know said sancho panza to me she seems the fairest creature in the world at any rate in nimbleness and jumping she won't give in to a tumbler by my face senora duchess she leaps from the ground on to the back of an ass like a cat have you seen her enchanted sancho asked the duke what seen her said sancho why who the devil was it but myself that first thought of the enchantment business she is much enchanted as my father the ecclesiastic when he heard them talking of giants and caitiffs and enchantments began to suspect that this must be don quixote of la mancha whose story the duke was always reading and he had himself often reproved him for it telling him it was foolish to read such fooleries and becoming convinced that his suspicion was correct addressing the duke he said very angrily to him senor your excellence will have to give account to god for what this good man does this don quixote or don simpleton or whatever his name is cannot i imagine be such a blockhead as your excellence would have him holding out encouragement to him to go on with his vagaries and follies then turning to address don quixote he said and you numbskull who put it into your head that you are a knight-errant and vanquish giants and capture miscreants go your ways in a good hour and in a good hour be it said to you go home and bring up your children if you have any and attend to your business and give over going wandering about the world gaping and making a laughing-stock of yourself to all who know you and all who don't where in heaven's name have you discovered that there are or ever were knights errant where are there giants in spain or miscreants in la mancha or enchanted dulcineas or all the rest of the silly things they tell about you don quixote listened attentively to the reverend gentleman's words and as soon as he perceived he had done speaking regardless of the presence of the duke and duchess he sprang to his feet with angry looks and an agitated countenance and said but the reply deserves a chapter to itself end of volume two part two chapter thirty one recording by expatriate in bangor maine volume two part two chapter thirty two of the ingenious gentleman don quixote of la mancha by miguel de cervantes saavedra translated by john ormsby eighteen twenty nine to eighteen ninety five this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine volume two part two chapter thirty two of the reply don quixote gave his censurer with other incidents grave and droll don quixote then having risen to his feet trembling from head to foot like a man dosed with mercury said in a hurried agitated voice the place i am in the presence in which i stand and the respect i have and always have had for the profession to which your worship belongs hold and bind the hands of my just indignation and as well for these reasons as because i know as every one knows that a gownsman's weapon is the same as a woman's the tongue i will with mine engage in equal combat with your worship from whom one might have expected good advice instead of foul abuse pious well-meant reproof requires a different demeanour and arguments of another sort at any rate to have reproved me in public and so roughly exceeds the bounds of proper reproof for that comes better with gentleness than with rudeness and it is not seemly to call the sinner roundly blockhead and booby without knowing anything of the sin that is reproved come tell me for which of the stupidities you have observed in me do you condemn and abuse me and bid me go home and look after my house and wife and children without knowing whether i have any is nothing more needed than to get a footing by hook or by crook in other people's houses to rule over the masters and that perhaps after having been brought up in all the straightness of some seminary and without ever having seen more of the world than may lie within twenty or thirty leagues round to fit one to lay down the law rashly for chivalry and pass judgment on knights errant is it haply an idle occupation or is the time ill spent that is spent in roaming the world in quest not of its enjoyments 
but of those arduous toils whereby the good mount upwards to the abodes of everlasting life if gentlemen great lords nobles men of high birth were to rate me as a fool i should take it as an irreparable insult but i care not a farthing if clerks who have never entered upon or trod the paths of chivalry should think me foolish knight i am and knight i will die if such be the pleasure of the most high some take the broad road of ever weaning ambition others that of mean and servile flattery others that of deceitful hypocrisy and some that of true religion but i led by my star follow the narrow path of knight errantry and in pursuing of that calling i despise wealth but not honour i have redressed injuries righted wrongs punished insolences vanquished giants and crushed monsters i am in love for no other reason than that it is incumbent on knights errant to be so but though i am i am no carnal-minded lover but one of the chaste platonic sort my intentions are always directed to worthy ends to do good to all and evil to none and if he who means this does this and makes this his practice deserves to be called a fool it is for your highnesses to say o oh, most excellent duke and duchess good by god cried sancho say no more in your own defence master mine for there's nothing more in the world to be said thought or insisted on and besides when this gentleman denies as he has that there are or ever have been any knights errant in the world is it any wonder if he knows nothing of what he has been talking about perhaps brother said the ecclesiastic you are that sancho panza that is mentioned to whom your master has promised an island yes i am said sancho and what's more i am one who deserves it as much as any one i am one of the sort attach thyself to the good and thou wilt be one of them and of those not with whom thou art bred but with whom thou art fed and of those who leans against a good tree a good shade covers him i have lent upon a good master and i have been for months going about with him and please god i shall be just such another long life to him and long life to me for neither will he be in any want of empires to rule or i of islands to govern no sancho my friend certainly not said the duke for in the name of senor don quixote i confer upon you the government of one of no small importance that i have at my disposal go down on thy knees sancho said don quixote and kiss the feet of his excellence for the favour he has bestowed upon thee sancho obeyed and on seeing this the ecclesiastic stood up from table completely out of temper exclaiming by the gown i wear i am almost inclined to say that your excellence is as great a fool as these sinners no wonder they are mad when people who are in their senses sanction their madness i leave your excellence with them for so long as they are in the house i will remain in my own and spare myself the trouble of reproving what i cannot remedy and without uttering another word or eating another morsel he went off the entreaties of the duke and duchess being entirely unavailing to stop him not that the duke said much to him for he could not because of the laughter his uncalled-for anger provoked when he had done laughing he said to don quixote you have replied on your own behalf so stoutly sir knight of the lions that there is no occasion to seek further satisfaction for this which though it may look like an offence is not so at all for as women can give no offence so more can ecclesiastics as you very well know that is true said don quixote and the reason is that he who is not liable to offence cannot give offence to any one women children and ecclesiastics as they cannot defend themselves though they may receive offence cannot be insulted because between the offence and the insult there is as your excellence very well knows this difference the insult comes from one who is capable of offering it and does so and maintains it the offence may come from any quarter without carrying insult to take an example a man is standing unsuspectingly in the street and ten others come up armed and beat him he draws his sword and quits himself like a man but the number of his antagonists makes it impossible for him to effect his purpose and avenge himself this man suffers an offence but not an insult another example will make the same thing plain a man is standing with his back turned another comes up and strikes him and after striking him takes to flight without waiting an instant and the other pursues him but does not overtake him he who received the blow received an offence but not an insult 
because an insult must be maintained. If he who struck him, though he did so sneakingly and treacherously, had drawn his sword and stood and faced him, then he who had been struck would have received offence and insult at the same time. Offence because he was struck treacherously, insult because he who struck him maintained what he had done, standing his ground without taking to flight. And so, according to the laws of the accursed duel, I may have received offence, but not insult, for neither women nor children can maintain it, nor can they wound, nor have they any way of standing their ground. And it is just the same with those connected with religion. For these three sorts of persons are without arms, offensive or defensive. And so, though naturally they are bound to defend themselves, they have no right to offend anybody. And though I said just now I might have received offence, I say now certainly not. For he who cannot receive an insult can still less give one. For which reasons I ought not to feel, nor do I feel, aggrieved at what that good man said to me. I only wish he had stayed a little longer, that I might have shown him the mistake he makes in supposing and maintaining that there are not and never have been any knights errant in the world. Had Amadis or any of his countless descendants heard him say as much, I am sure it would not have gone well with his lordship. I will take my oath of that, said Sancho. They would have given him a slash that would have slid him down from top to toe, like a pomegranate or a ripe melon. They were likely fellows to put up with jokes of that sort. By my faith, I am certain if Reynaldos of Montalvan had heard the little man's words, he would have given him such a spank on the mouth that he wouldn't have spoken for the next three years. Ay, let him tackle them, and he'll see how he'll get out of their hands. The Duchess, as she listened to Sancho, was ready to die with laughter, and in her own mind she set him down as droller and madder than his master, and there were a good many just then who were of the same opinion. Don Quixote finally grew calm, and dinner came to an end. And as the cloth was removed, four damsels came in, one of them with a silver basin, another with a jug also of silver, a third with two fine white towels on her shoulder, and the fourth with her arms bared to the elbows. And in her white hands, for white they certainly were, a round ball of maple soap. The one with the basin approached, and with arch composure and impudence, thrust it under Don Quixote's chin who wondering at such a ceremony said never a word supposing it to be the custom of that country to wash beards instead of hands he therefore stretched his out as far as he could and at the same instant the jug began to pour and the damsel with the soap rubbed his beard briskly raising snowflakes for the soap lather was no less white not only over the beard but all over the face and over the eyes of the submissive knight so that they were perforce obliged to keep shut the duke and duchess, who had not known anything about this, waited to see what came of this strange washing. The barber damsel, when she had him a hand's breadth deep in lather, pretended that there was no more water, and bade the one with the jug go and fetch some, while Senor Don Quixote waited. She did so, and Don Quixote was left the strangest and most ludicrous figure that could be imagined. All those present, and there were a good many, were watching him, and as they saw him there with half a yard of neck and that uncommonly brown his eyes shut and his beard full of soap it was a great wonder and only by great discretion that they were able to restrain their laughter the damsels the concoctors of the joke kept their eyes down not daring to look at their master and mistress and as for them laughter and anger struggled within them and they knew not what to do whether to punish the audacity of the girls or to reward them for the amusement they had received from seeing Don Quixote in such a plight. At length the damsel with the jug returned, and they made an end of washing Don Quixote, and the one who carried the towels very deliberately wiped him and dried him, and all four together making him a profound obeisance and curtsy, they were about to go, when the duke, lest Don Quixote should see through the joke, called out to the one with the basin, saying, Come and wash me, and take care that there is water enough, the girl, sharp-witted and prompt, came and placed the basin for the duke as she had done for Don Quixote, and they soon had him well soaped and washed, and having wiped him dry, they made their obeisance and retired. It appeared afterwards that the duke had sworn that if they had not washed him as they had Don Quixote, he would have punished them for their impudence, which they adroitly atoned for by soaping him as well. 
Sancho observed the ceremony of the washing very attentively, and said to himself, God bless me, if it were only the custom in this country to wash squires' beards too, as well as knights, for by God and upon my soul I want it badly, and if they gave me a scrape of the razor besides, I'd take it as a still greater kindness. What are you saying to yourself, Sancho? asked the Duchess. I was saying, Senora, he replied, that in the courts of other princes, when the cloth is taken away, I have always heard say they give water for the hands, but not lie for the beard, and that shows it is good to live long that you may see much. To be sure, they say, too, that he who lives a long life must undergo much evil, though to undergo a washing of that sort is pleasure rather than pain. Don't be uneasy, friend Sancho, said the Duchess. I will take care that my damsels wash you, and even put you in the tub if necessary. I'll be content with a beard, said Sancho, at any rate for the present, and as for the future, God has decreed what is to be. Attend to worthy Sancho's request, Seneschal, said the Duchess, and do exactly what he wishes. The Seneschal replied that Senor Sancho should be obeyed in everything, and with that he went away to dinner and took Sancho along with him, while the Duke and Duchess and Don Quixote remained at table discussing a great variety of things, but all bearing on the calling of arms and knight-errantry. The Duchess begged Don Quixote, as he seemed to have a retentive memory, to describe and portray to her the beauty and features of the Lady Dulcinea del Toboso, for, judging by what fame trumpeted abroad of her beauty, and Ciceronian and Demosthenian eloquence to sound its praises. What does Demosthenian mean, Senor Don Quixote, said the Duchess? It is a word I never heard in all my life. Demosthenian eloquence, said Don Quixote, means the eloquence of Demosthenes, as Ciceronian means that of Cicero, who were the two most eloquent orators in the world. True, said the Duke, you must have lost your wits to ask such a question. Nevertheless, Senor Don Quixote would greatly gratify us if he would depict her to us, for never fear, even in an outline or sketch, she will be something to make the fairest envious. I would do so certainly, said Don Quixote, had she not been blurred to my mind's eye by the misfortune that fell upon her a short time since, one of such a nature that I am more ready to weep over it than to describe it. For your highness must know that, going a few days back to kiss her hands and receive her benediction, approbation, and permission for this third sally, I found her altogether a different being from the one I had sought. I found her enchanted and changed from a princess into a peasant, from fair to foul, from an angel into a devil, from fragrant to pestiferous, from refined to clownish, from a dignified lady into a jumping tomboy, and, in a word, from Dulcinea del Toboso into a coarse Sayago wench. God bless me, said the Duke aloud at this. Who can have done the world such an injury? Who can have robbed it of the beauty that gladdened it, of the grace and gaiety that charmed it, of the modesty that shed a lustre upon it? Who? replied Don Quixote. Who could it be but some malignant enchanter of the many that persecute me out of envy, that accursed wraith born into the world to obscure and bring to naught the achievements of the good, and glorify and exalt the deeds of the wicked. Enchanters have persecuted me, enchanters persecute me still, and enchanters will continue to persecute me until they have sunk me and my lofty chivalry in the deep abyss of oblivion, and they injure and wound me where they know I feel it most. For to deprive a knight-errant of his lady is to deprive him of the eyes he sees with, of the sun that gives him light, of the food whereby he lives. Many a time before have I said it, and I say it now once more, a knight-errant without a lady is like a tree without leaves, a building without a foundation, or a shadow without the body that causes it. There is no denying it, said the Duchess, but still, if we are to believe the history of Don Quixote that has come out here lately with general applause, it is to be inferred from it, if I mistake not, that you never saw the lady Dulcinea, and that the said lady is nothing in the world but an imaginary lady, one that you yourself begot and gave birth to in your brain, and adorned with whatever charms and perfection you chose. There is a good deal to be said on that point, said Don Quixote. God knows whether there be any Dulcinea or not in the world, or whether she is imaginary or not imaginary. These are things, the proof of which must not be pushed to extreme lengths. I have not begotten nor given birth to my lady, 
though I behold her as she needs must be, a lady who contains in herself all the qualities to make her famous throughout the world, beautiful without blemish, dignified without haughtiness, tender and yet modest, gracious from courtesy and courteous from good breeding, and lastly of exalted lineage, because beauty shines forth and excels with a higher degree of perfection upon good blood than in the fair of lowly birth. That is true, said the duke, but Señor Don Quixote will give me leave to say what I am constrained to say by the story of his exploits that I have read, from which it is to be inferred that granting there is a Dulcinea in El Toboso or out of it, and that she is in the highest degree beautiful as you have described her to us, as regards the loftiness of her lineage, she is not on a par with the Orianas, Alastrajareas, Marasimas, or others of that sort, with whom, as you well know, the histories abound. To that I may reply, said Don Quixote, that Dulcinea is the daughter of her own works, and that virtues rectify blood, and that lowly virtue is more to be regarded and esteemed than exalted vice. Dulcinea, besides, has that within her that may raise her to be a crowned and sceptred queen, for the merit of a fair and virtuous woman is capable of performing greater miracles, and virtually, though not formally, she has in herself higher fortunes. I protest, Señor Don Quixote, said the Duchess, that in all you say you go most cautiously and lead in hand, as the saying is. Henceforth I will believe myself, and I will take care that every one in my house believes, even my lord the duke, if needs be, that there is a Dulcinea in El Toboso, and that she is living to-day, and that she is beautiful and nobly born, and deserves to have such a knight as Señor Don Quixote in her service, and that is the highest praise that it is in my power to give her, or that I can think of. But I cannot help entertaining a doubt, and having a certain grudge against Sancho Panza. The doubt is this, that the aforesaid history declares that the said Sancho Panza, when he carried a letter on your worship's behalf to the said Lady Dulcinea, found her sifting a sack of wheat, and more by token it says it was red wheat, a thing that makes me doubt the loftiness of her lineage. To this Don Quixote made answer, Senora, your highness must know that everything or almost everything that happens me transcends the ordinary limits of what happens to other knights errant, whether it be that it is directed by the inscrutable will of destiny or by the malice of some jealous enchanter. Now, it is an established fact that all or most famous knights errant have some special gift, one that of being proof against enchantment, another that of being made of such invulnerable flesh that he cannot be wounded, as was the famous Roland, one of the twelve peers of France, of whom it is related that he could not be wounded except in the sole of his left foot, and that it must be with a point of a stout pin, and not with any other sort of weapon whatever. And so, when Bernardo del Carpio slew him at Roncevales, finding that he could not wound him with steel, he lifted him up from the ground in his arms and strangled him, calling to mind seasonably the death which Hercules inflicted on Antaeus, the fierce giant that they say was a son of Terra. I would infer from what I have mentioned that perhaps I may have some gift of this kind, not that of being invulnerable, because experience has many times proved to me that I am of tender flesh, and not at all impenetrable, nor that of being proof against enchantment, for I have already seen myself thrust into a cage in which all the world would not have been able to confine me except by force of enchantments. But as I delivered myself from that one, I am inclined to believe that there is no other that can hurt me. And so these enchanters, seeing that they cannot exert their vile craft against my person, revenge themselves on what I love most, and seek to rob me of life by maltreating that of Dulcinea in whom I live. And therefore I am convinced that when my squire carried my message to her, they changed her into a common peasant girl, engaged in such a mean occupation as sifting wheat. I have already said, however, that that wheat was not red wheat, nor wheat at all, but grains of orient pearl. And as a proof of all this, I must tell your highnesses that coming to El Toboso a short time back, I was altogether unable to discover the palace of Dulcinea, and that the next day, though Sancho my squire saw her in her own proper shape, which is the fairest in the world, to me she appeared to be a coarse, ill-favoured farm wench, and by no means a well-spoken one, she who is propriety itself. 
and so as i am not and so far as one can judge cannot be enchanted she it is that is enchanted that is smitten that is altered changed and transformed in her have my enemies revenged themselves upon me and for her shall i live in ceaseless tears until i see her in her pristine state i have mentioned this lest anybody should mind what sancho said about dulcinea's winnowing or sifting for as they changed her to me it is no wonder if they changed her to him dulcinea is illustrious and well-born and of one of the gentle families of el toboso which are many ancient and good therein most assuredly not small is the share of the peerless dulcinea through whom her town will be famous and celebrated in ages to come as troy was through helen and spain through la cava though with a better title and tradition for another thing i would have your graces understand that sancho panza is one of the drollest squires that ever served knight-errant sometimes there is a simplicity about him so acute that it is an amusement to try and make out whether he is simple or sharp he has mischievous tricks that stamp him rogue and blundering ways that prove him a booby he doubts everything and believes everything when i fancy he is on the point of coming down headlong from sheer stupidity he comes out with something shrewd that sends him up to the skies after all i would not exchange him for another squire though i were given a city to boot and therefore i am in doubt whether it will be well to send him to the government your highness has bestowed upon him though i perceive in him a certain aptitude for the work of governing so that with a little trimming of his understanding he would manage any government as easily as the king does his taxes and moreover we know already ample experience that it does not require much cleverness or much learning to be a governor for there are a hundred round about us that scarcely know how to read and govern like gerfalcons the main point is that they should have good intentions and be desirous of doing right in all things for they will never be at a loss for persons to advise and direct them in what they have to do like those knight governors who being no lawyers pronounce sentences with the aid of an assessor my advice to him will be to take no bribe and surrender no right and i have some other little matters in reserve that shall be produced in due season for sancho's benefit and the advantage of the island he is to govern the duke duchess and don quixote had reached this point in their conversation when they heard voices and a great hubbub in the palace and sancho burst abruptly into the room all glowing with anger with a straining cloth by way of a bib and followed by several servants or more properly speaking kitchen boys and other underlings one of whom carried a small trough full of water that from its colour and impurity was plainly dishwater the one with the trough pursued him and followed him everywhere he went endeavouring with the utmost persistence to thrust it under his chin while another kitchen boy seemed anxious to wash his beard what is all this brothers asked the duchess what is it what do you want to do to this good man you forget he is a governor-elect to which the barber kitchen boy replied the gentleman will not let himself be washed as is customary and as my lord and the seigneur his master have been yes i will said sancho in a great rage but i'd like it to be with cleaner towels clearer lie and not such dirty hands for there's not so much difference between me and my master that he should be washed with angel's water and i with devil's lie the customs of countries and princes palaces are only good so long as they give no annoyance but the way of washing they have here is worse than doing penance i have a clean beard and i don't require to be refreshed in that fashion and whoever comes to wash me or touch a hair of my head i mean to say my beard with all due respect be it said i'll give him a punch that will leave my fist sunk in his skull for ceremonies and soapings of this sort are more like jokes than the polite attentions of one's host the duchess was ready to die with laughter when she saw sancho's rage and heard his words but it was no pleasure to don quixote to see him in such a sorry trim with a dingy towel about him and the hangers-on of the kitchen all around him so making a low bow to the duke and duchess as if to ask their permission to speak he addressed the rout in a dignified tone hola gentlemen you let that youth alone and go back to where you came from or anywhere else if you like my squire is as clean as any other person and those troughs are as bad as narrow thin-necked jars to him take my advice and leave him alone for neither he nor i understand joking sancho took the word out of his mouth and went on 
Nay, let them come and try their jokes on the country bumpkin, for it's about as likely I'll stand them as that it's now midnight. Let them bring a comb here, or what they please, and curry this beard of mine, and if they get anything out of it that offends against cleanliness, let them clip me to the skin. Upon this the Duchess, laughing all the while, said, Sancho Panza is right, and always will be in all he says. He is clean, and as he says himself, he does not require to be washed. And if our ways do not please him, he is free to choose. Besides, you promoters of cleanliness have been excessively careless and thoughtless, I don't know if I ought not to say audacious, to bring troughs and wooden utensils and kitchen dishclouts, instead of basins and jugs of pure gold and towels of holland, to such a person in such a beard. But after all, you are ill-conditioned and ill-bred, and spiteful as you are, you cannot help showing the grudge you have against the squires of knights-errant. The impudent servitors, and even the seneschal who came with them, took the duchess to be speaking in earnest, so they removed the straining cloth from Sancho's neck, and with something like shame and confusion of face, went off all of them and left him, whereupon he, seeing himself safe out of that extreme danger, as it seemed to him, ran and fell on his knees before the duchess saying from great ladies great favours may be looked for this which your grace has done me to-day cannot be requited with less than wishing i was dubbed a knight-errant to devote myself all the days of my life to the service of so exalted a lady i am a labouring man my name is sancho panza i am married i have children and i am serving as a squire if in any one of these ways i can serve your highness I will not be longer in obeying than your grace in commanding. It is easy to see, Sancho, replied the Duchess, that you have learned to be polite in the school of politeness itself. I mean to say it is easy to see that you have been nursed in the bosom of Señor Don Quixote, who is, of course, the cream of good breeding and flower of ceremony, or ceremony, as you would say yourself. Fair be the fortunes of such a master and such a servant the one the cynosure of knight-errantry the other the star of squirely fidelity rise sancho my friend i will repay your courtesy by taking care that my lord the duke makes good to you the promised gift of the government as soon as possible with this the conversation came to an end and don quixote retired to take his midday sleep but the duchess begged sancho unless he had a very great desire to go to sleep to come and spend the afternoon with her and her damsels in a very cool chamber. Sancho replied that though he certainly had the habit of sleeping four or five hours in the heat of the day in summer, to serve her excellence he would try with all his might not to sleep even one that day, and that he would come in obedience to her command, and with that he went off. The duke gave fresh orders with respect to treating Don Quixote as a knight-errant, without departing even in smallest particular from the style in which, as the stories tell us, they used to treat the knights of old. End of Volume 2, Part 2, Chapter 32 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine Volume 2, Part 2, Chapter 33 of the ingenious gentleman don quixote of la mancha by miguel de cervantes saavedra translated by john ormsby eighteen twenty nine to eighteen ninety five this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine volume two part two chapter thirty three of the delectable discourse which the duchess and her damsels held with sancho panza well worth reading and noting the history records that Sancho did not sleep that afternoon, but in order to keep his word came, before he had well done dinner, to visit the Duchess, who, finding enjoyment in listening to him, made him sit down beside her on a low seat, though Sancho, out of pure good breeding, wanted not to sit down. The Duchess, however, told him he was to sit down as governor and talk as squire, as in both respects he was worthy of even the chair of the Cid Ruiz Diaz the Campeador sancho shrugged his shoulders obeyed and sat down and all the duchess's damsels and duennas gathered round him waiting in profound silence to hear what he would say it was the duchess however who spoke first saying 
now that we are alone and that there is nobody here to overhear us i should be glad if the senor governor would relieve me of certain doubts i have rising out of the history of the great don quixote that is now in print one is inasmuch as worthy sancho never saw dulcinea i mean the lady dulcinea del toboso nor took don quixote's letter to her for it was left in the memorandum book in the sierra morena how did he dare to invent the answer and all that about finding her sifting wheat the whole story being a deception and falsehood and so much to the prejudice of the peerless dulcinea's good name a thing that is not at all becoming the character and fidelity of a good squire at these words sancho without uttering one in reply got up from his chair and with noiseless steps with his body bent and his finger on his lips went all round the room lifting up the hangings and this done he came back to his seat and said now senora that i have seen that there is no one except the bystanders listening to us on the sly i will answer what you have asked me and all that you may ask me without fear or dread and the first thing i have got to say is that for my own part i hold my master don quixote to be stark mad though sometimes he says things that to my mind and indeed everybody's that listens to him are so wise and run in such a straight furrow that satan himself could not have said them better but for all that really and beyond all question it's my firm belief he is cracked well then as this is clear to my mind i can venture to make him believe things that have neither head nor tail like that affair of the answer to the letter and that other of six or eight days ago which is not yet in history that is to say the affair of the enchantment of my lady dulcinea for i made him believe she is enchanted though there is no more truth in it than over the hills of ubeda the duchess begged him to tell her about the enchantment or deception so sancho told the whole story exactly as it had happened and his hearers were not a little amused by it and then resuming the duchess said in consequence of what worthy sancho has told me a doubt starts up in my mind and there comes a kind of whisper to my ear that says if don quixote be mad crazy and cracked and sancho panza his squire knows it and notwithstanding serves and follows him and goes trusting to his empty promises there can be no doubt he must be still madder and sillier than his master and that being so it will be cast in your teeth senora duchess if you give the said sancho an island to govern for how will he who does not know how to govern himself know how to govern others by god senora said sancho but that doubt comes timely but your grace may say it out and speak plainly or as you like for i know what you say is true and if i were wise i should have left my master long ago but this was my fate this was my bad luck i can't help it i must follow him we're from the same village i've eaten his bread i'm fond of him i'm grateful he gave me his ass colts and above all i'm faithful so it's quite impossible for anything to separate us except the pickaxe and shovel and if your highness does not like to give me the government you promised god made me without it and maybe your not giving it to me will be all the better for my conscience for fool as i am i know the proverb to her hurt the ant gut wings and it may be that sancho the squire will get to heaven sooner than sancho the governor they make as good bread here as in france and by night all cats are grey and a hard case enough his who hasn't broken his fast at two in the afternoon and there's no stomach a hand's breadth bigger than another and the same can be filled with straw or hay as the saying is and the little birds of the field have god for their purveyor and caterer and four yards of cuenca frieze keep one warmer than four of segovia broadcloth and when we quit this world and are put underground the prince travels by as narrow a path as the journeyman and the pope's body does not take up more feet of earth than the sacristan's for all that the one is higher than the other for when we go to our graves we all pack ourselves up and make ourselves small or rather they pack us up and make us small in spite of us and then good night to us and i say once more if your ladyship does not like to give me the island because i'm a fool like a wise man i will take care to give myself no trouble about it i have heard say that behind the cross there is the devil and that all that glitters is not gold and that from among the oxen and the ploughs and the yokes wamba the husbandman was taken to be made king of spain and from among brocades and pleasures and riches roderick was taken to be devoured by adders if the verses of the old ballads don't lie 
to be sure they don't lie exclaimed doña rodriguez the duenna who was one of the listeners why there's a ballad that says they put king rodrigo alive into a tomb full of toads and adders and lizards and that two days afterwards the king in a plaintive feeble voice cried out from within the tomb they gnaw me now they gnaw me now they're where i most did sin and according to that the gentleman has good reason to say he would rather be a labouring man than a king if vermin were to eat him the duchess could not help laughing at the simplicity of her duenna or wondering at the language and proverbs of sancho to whom she said worthy sancho knows very well that when once a knight has made a promise he strives to keep it though it should cost him his life my lord and husband the duke though not one of the most errant sort is none the less a knight for that reason and will keep his word about the promised island in spite of the envy and malice of the world let sancho be of good cheer for when he least expects it he will find himself seated on the throne of his island and seat of dignity and will take possession of his government that he may discard it for another of three bordered brocade the charge i give him is to be careful how he governs his vassals bearing in mind that they are all loyal and well-born as to governing them well said sancho there is no need of charging me to do that for i am kind-hearted by nature and full of compassion for the poor there is no stealing the loaf from him who kneads and bakes and by my faith it won't do to throw false dice with me i am an old dog and i know all about tus tus i can be wide awake if need be and i don't let clouds come before my eyes for i know where the shoe pinches me i say so because with me the good will have support and protection and the bad neither footing nor access and it seems to me that in governments to make a beginning is everything and maybe after having been governor a fortnight i'll take kindly to the work and know more about it than the field labour i have been brought up to you are right sancho said the duchess for no one is born ready taught and the bishops are made out of men and not out of stones but to return to the subject we were discussing just now the enchantment of the lady dulcinea i look upon it as certain and something more than evident that sancho's idea of practising a deception upon his master making him believe that the peasant girl was dulcinea and that if he did not recognise her it must be because she was enchanted was all a device of one of the enchanters that persecute don quixote for in truth and earnest i know from good authority that the coarse country wench who jumped up on the ass was and is dulcinea del toboso and that worthy sancho though he fancies himself the deceiver is the one that is deceived and that there is no more reason to doubt the truth of this than of anything else we never saw senor sancho panza must know that we too have enchanters here that are well disposed to us and tell us what goes on in the world plainly and distinctly without subterfuge or deception and believe me sancho that agile country lass was and is dulcinea del toboso who is as much enchanted as the mother that bore her and when we least expect it we shall see her in her own proper form and then sancho will be disabused of the error he is under at present all that's very possible said sancho panza and now i'm willing to believe what my master says about what he saw in the cave of montesinos where he says he saw the lady dulcinea del toboso in the very same dress and apparel that i said i had seen her in when i enchanted her all to please myself it must be all exactly the other way as your ladyship says because it is impossible to suppose that out of my poor wit such a cunning trick could be concocted in a moment nor do i think my master is so mad that by my weak and feeble persuasion he could be made to believe a thing so out of all reason but senora your excellence must not therefore think me ill-disposed for a dolt like me is not bound to see into the thoughts and plots of those vile enchanters i invented all that to escape my master's scolding and not with any intention of hurting him and if it has turned out differently there is a god in heaven who judges our hearts that is true said the duchess but tell me sancho what is this you say about the cave of montesinos for i should like to know sancho upon this related to her word for word what has been said already touching that adventure and having heard it the duchess said from this occurrence it may be inferred that as the great don quixote says he saw there the same country wench sancho saw on the way from el toboso it is no doubt dulcinea and that there are some very active and exceedingly busy enchanters about so i say said sancho and if my lady dulcinea is enchanted so much the worse for her and i am not going to pick a quarrel with my master's enemies who seem to be many and spiteful 
the truth is that the one i saw was a country wench and i set her down to be a country wench and if that was dulcinea it must not be laid at my door nor should i be called to answer for it or take the consequences but they must go nagging at me at every step sancho said it sancho did it sancho here sancho there as if sancho was nobody at all and not that same sancho panza that's now going all over the world in books so samson carrasco told me and he's at any rate one that's a bachelor of salamanca and people of that sort can't lie except when the whim seizes them or they have some very good reason for it so there's no occasion for anybody to quarrel with me and then i have a good character and as i have heard my master say a good name is better than great riches let them only stick me into this government and they'll see wonders for one who has been a good squire will be a good governor all worthy sancho's observations said the duchess are catonian sentences or at any rate out of the very heart of michael verino himself who florentibus occidit anis in fact to speak in his own style under a bad cloak there's often a good drinker indeed senora said sancho i never yet drank out of wickedness from thirst i have very likely for i have nothing of the hypocrite in me i drink when i'm inclined or if i'm not inclined when they offer it to me so as not to look either straight-laced or ill-bred for when a friend drinks one's health what heart can be so hard as not to return it but if i put on my shoes i don't dirty them besides squires to knights errant mostly drink water but they are always wandering among woods forests and meadows mountains and crags without a drop of wine to be had if they gave their eyes for it so i believe said the duchess and now let sancho go and take his sleep and we will talk by and by at greater length and settle how he may soon go and stick himself into the government as he says sancho once more kissed the duchess's hand and entreated her to let good care be taken of his dapple for he was the light of his eyes what is dapple said the duchess my ass said sancho which not to mention him by that name i'm accustomed to call dapple i begged this lady duenna here to take care of him when i came into the castle and she got as angry as if i had said she was ugly or old though it ought to be more natural and proper for duennas to feed asses than to ornament chambers god bless me what a spite a gentleman of my village had against these ladies he must have been some clown said doña rodriguez the duenna for if he had been a gentleman and well-born he would have exalted them higher than the horns of the moon that will do said the duchess no more of this hush doña rodriguez and let senor panza rest easy and leave the treatment of dapple in my charge for as he is a treasure of sancho's i'll put him on the apple of my eye it will be enough for him to be in the stable said sancho for neither he nor i are worthy to rest a moment in the apple of your highness's eye and i'd as soon stab myself as consent to it for though my master says that in civilities it is better to lose by a card too many than a card too few when it comes to civilities to asses we must mind what we are about and keep within due bounds take him to your government sancho said the duchess and there you will be able to make as much of him as you like and even release him from work and pension him off don't think senora duchess that you have said anything absurd said sancho i have seen more than two asses go to governments and for me to take mine with me would be nothing new sancho's words made the duchess laugh again and gave her fresh amusement and dismissing him to sleep she went away to tell the duke the conversation she had had with him and between them they plotted and arranged to play a joke upon don quixote that was to be a rare one and entirely in knight-errantry style and in that same style they practised several upon him so much in keeping and so clever that they form the best adventures this great history contains. End of volume two, part two, chapter thirty three. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Volume two, part two, chapter thirty four. Of the ingenious gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra. Translated by John Ormsby. 1829 to 1895 this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine volume two part two chapter thirty four which relates how they learned the way in which they were to disenchant the peerless dulcinea del toboso which is one of the rarest adventures in this book great was the pleasure the duke and duchess took 
in the conversation of Don Quixote and Sancho Panza, and, more bent than ever upon the plan they had, of practicing some jokes upon them that should have the look and appearance of adventures, they took as their base of action what Don Quixote had already told them about the cave of Montesinos, in order to play him a famous one. But what the Duchess marvelled at above all was that Sancho's simplicity could be so great as to make him believe as absolute truth that Dulcinea had been enchanted, when it was he himself who had been the enchanter and trickster in the business. Having therefore instructed their servants in everything they were to do, six days afterwards they took him out to hunt, with as great a retinue of huntsmen and beaters as a crowned king. They presented Don Quixote with a hunting suit, and Sancho with another of the finest green cloth. But Don Quixote declined to put his on, saying that he must soon return to the hard pursuit of arms, and could not carry wardrobes or stores with him. Sancho, however, took what they gave him, meaning to sell it at the first opportunity. The appointed day, having arrived, Don Quixote armed himself, and Sancho arrayed himself, and mounted on his dapple, for he would not give him up, though they offered him a horse. He placed himself in the midst of the troop of huntsmen. The duchess came out splendidly attired, and Don Quixote, in pure courtesy and politeness, held the rein of her palfrey, though the duke wanted not to allow him, and at last they reached a wood that lay between two high mountains, where after occupying various posts, ambushes, and paths, and distributing the party in different positions, the hunt began with great noise, shouting and hallooing, so that between the baying of the hounds and the blowing of the horns they could not hear one another. The duchess dismounted, and with a sharp boar-spear in her hand, posted herself where she knew the wild boars were in the habit of passing. The duke and Don Quixote likewise dismounted, and placed themselves one on each side of her. Sancho took up a position in the rear of all, without dismounting from Dapple, whom he dared not desert, lest some mischief should befall him. Scarcely had they taken their stand in a line with several of their servants, when they saw a huge boar, closely pressed by the hounds and followed by the huntsmen, making towards them, grinding his teeth and tusks, and scattering foam from his mouth. As soon as he saw him, Don Quixote, bracing his shield on his arm and drawing his sword, advanced to meet him. The duke with boar-spear did the same, but the duchess would have gone in front of them all had not the duke prevented her. Sancho alone, deserting Dapple at the sight of the mighty beast, took to his heels as hard as he could and strove in vain to mount a tall oak. As he was clinging to a branch, however, halfway up in his struggle to reach the top, the bough, such was his ill luck and hard fate, gave way, and caught in his fall by a broken limb of the oak, he hung suspended in the air, unable to reach the ground. Finding himself in this position, and that the green coat was beginning to tear, and reflecting that if the fierce animal came that way he might be able to get at him, he began to utter such cries and call for help so earnestly that all who heard him and did not see him felt sure he must be in the teeth of some wild beast. In the end, the tusked boar fell pierced by the blades of the many spears they held in front of him, and Don Quixote, turning round at the cries of Sancho, for he knew by them that it was he, saw him hanging from the oak head downwards, with Dapple, who did not forsake him in his distress, close beside him, and Cid Hamet, observed that he seldom saw Sancho Panza without seeing Dapple, or Dapple without seeing Sancho Panza. Such was their attachment and loyalty one to the other. Don Quixote went over and unhooked Sancho, who, as soon as he found himself on the ground, looked at the rent in his hunting coat and was grieved to the heart, for he thought he had got a patrimonial estate in that suit. Meanwhile, they had slung the mighty boar across the back of a mule, and having covered it with sprigs of rosemary and branches of myrtle, they bore it away as the spoils of victory to some large field tents, which had been pitched in the middle of the wood, where they found the tables laid and dinner served in such grand and sumptuous style that it was easy to see the rank and magnificence of those who had provided it. Sancho, as he showed the rents in his torn suit to the duchess, observed, if we had been hunting hares or after small birds, my coat would have been safe from being in the plight it's in. I don't know what pleasure one can find in lying in wait for an animal that may take your life with his tusk if he gets at you. I recollect having heard an old ballad sung that says, By bears be thou devoured, as erst was famous favila. 
That, said Don Quixote, was a Gothic king, who going a-hunting was devoured by a bear. Just so, said Sancho, and I would not have kings and princes expose themselves to such dangers for the sake of a pleasure which to my mind ought not to be one, as it consists in killing an animal that has done no harm whatever. Quite the contrary, Sancho, you are wrong there, said the duke, for hunting is more suitable and requisite for kings and princes than for anybody else. The chase is the emblem of war. It has stratagems, wiles, and crafty devices for overcoming the enemy in safety. In it, extreme cold and intolerable heat have to be borne. Indolence and sleep are despised. The bodily powers are invigorated. The limbs of him who engages in it are made supple. And, in a word, it is a pursuit which may be followed without injury to any one and with enjoyment to many. And the best of it is, it is not for everybody as field sports of other sorts are, except hawking, which also is only for kings and great lords. Reconsider your opinion, therefore, Sancho, and when you are governor, take to hunting, and you will find the good of it. Nay, said Sancho, the good governor should have a broken leg and keep at home. It would be a nice thing if, after people had been at the trouble of coming to look for him on business, the governor were to be away in the forest enjoying himself. The government would go on badly in that fashion. By my faith, senor, Hunting and amusements are more fit for idlers than for governors. What I intend to amuse myself with is playing all fours at Easter time, and bowls on Sundays and holidays, for these huntings don't suit my condition or agree with my conscience. God grant it may turn out so, said the Duke, because it's a long step from saying to doing. Be that as it may, said Sancho, pledges don't distress a good payer, and he whom God helps does better than he who gets up early and it's the tripes that carry the feet and not the feet the tripes i mean to say that if god gives me help and i do my duty honestly no doubt i'll govern better than a gerfalcon nay let them only put a finger in my mouth and they'll see whether i can bite or not the curse of god and all his saints upon thee thou accursed sancho exclaimed don quixote when will the day come as i have often said to thee when i shall hear thee make one single coherent rational remark without proverbs Pray, your highnesses, leave this fool alone, for he will grind your souls between, not to say two, but two thousand proverbs, dragged in as much in season, and as much to the purpose as, may God grant as much health to him, or to me if I want to listen to them. Sancho Panza's proverbs, said the Duchess, though more in number than the Greek commanders, are not therefore less to be esteemed for the conciseness of the maxims. For my own part, I can say they give me more pleasure than others that may be better brought in and more seasonably introduced. In pleasant conversation of this sort, they passed out of the tent into the wood, and the day was spent in visiting some of the posts and hiding places, and then night closed in, not, however, as brilliantly or tranquilly as might have been expected at the season, for it was then midsummer, but bringing with it a kind of haze that greatly aided the project of the Duke and Duchess and thus as night began to fall and a little after twilight set in suddenly the whole wood on all four sides seemed to be on fire and shortly after here there on all sides a vast number of trumpets and other military instruments were heard as if several troops of cavalry were passing through the wood the blaze of the fire and the noise of the warlike instruments almost blinded the eyes and deafened the ears of those that stood by and indeed of all who were in the wood. Then there were heard repeated lelilies after the fashion of the Moors when they rushed to battle. Trumpets and clarions brayed, drums beat, fifes played, so unceasingly and so fast that he could not have had any senses who did not lose them with a confused din of so many instruments. The Duke was astounded, the Duchess amazed, Don Quixote wondering, Sancho Panza trembling, and indeed even they who were aware of the cause were frightened in their fear silence fell upon them and a postillion in the guise of a demon passed in front of them blowing in lieu of a bugle a huge hollow horn that gave out a horrible hoarse note oh there brother courier cried the duke who are you where are you going what troops are these that seem to be passing through the wood to which the courier replied in a harsh discordant voice i am the devil i am in search of don quixote of la mancha those who are coming this way are six troops of enchanters who are bringing on a triumphal car the peerless dulcinea del toboso she comes under enchantment together with a gallant frenchman montesinos 
to give instructions to Don Quixote as to how she, the said lady, may be disenchanted. If you were the devil, as you say, and as your appearance indicates, said the duke, you would have known the said knight Don Quixote of La Mancha, for you have him here before you. By God, and upon my conscience, said the devil, I never observed it, for my mind is occupied with so many different things that I was forgetting the main thing I came about. This demon must be an honest fellow and a good Christian, said Sancho, for if he wasn't he wouldn't swear by God and his conscience. I feel sure now there must be good souls even in hell itself. Without dismounting, the demon then turned to Don Quixote and said, The unfortunate but valiant knight Montesino sends me to thee, the knight of the lions, would that I saw thee in their claws, bidding me tell thee to wait for him wherever I may find thee, as he brings with him her whom they call Dulcinea del Toboso, that he may show thee what is needful in order to disenchant her. And as I came for no more, I need stay no longer. Demons of my sort be with thee, and good angels with these gentles. And so saying, he blew his huge horn, turned about, and went off without waiting for a reply from any one. They all felt fresh wonder, but particularly Sancho and Don Quixote. Sancho, to see how in defiance of the truth, they would have it that Dulcinea was enchanted. Don Quixote, because he could not feel sure whether what had happened to him in the cave of Montesinos was true or not, and as he was deep in these cogitations, the duke said to him, Do you mean to wait, Señor Don Quixote? Why not, replied he. Here will I wait, fearless and firm, though all hell should come to attack me. Well then, if I see another devil or hear another horn like the last, I'll wait here as much as in Flanders, said Sancho. Night now closed in more completely, and many lights began to flit through the wood, just as those fiery exhalations from the earth, that look like shooting stars to our eyes, flit through the heavens. A frightful noise, too, was heard, like that made by the solid wheels the ox-carts usually have, by the harsh, ceaseless creaking of which, they say, the bears and wolves are put to flight, if there happen to be anywhere they are passing. In addition to all this commotion, there came a further disturbance to increase the tumult, for now it seemed as if, in truth, on all four sides of the wood, four encounters or battles were going on at the same time. In one quarter resounded the dull noise of a terrible cannonade. In another, numberless muskets were being discharged. The shouts of the combatants sounded almost close at hand, and farther away the Moorish lelilies were raised again and again. In a word, the bugles, the horns, the clarions, the trumpets, the drums, the cannon, the musketry, and above all the tremendous noise of the carts, all made up together a din so confused and terrific that Don Quixote had need to summon up all his courage to brave it. But Sancho's gave way, and he fell fainting on the skirt of the Duchess's robe, who let him lie there and promptly bade them throw water in his face. This was done and he came to himself by the time that one of the carts with the creaking wheels reached the spot. It was drawn by four plodding oxen, all covered with black housings. On each horn they had fixed a large lighted wax taper, and on the top of the cart was constructed a raised seat, on which sat a venerable old man with a beard whiter than the very snow, and so long that it fell below his waist. He was dressed in a long robe of black buckram, for as the cart was thickly set with a multitude of candles, it was easy to make out everything that was on it. Leading it were two hideous demons, also clad in buckram, with countenances so frightful that Sancho, having once seen them, shut his eyes so as not to see them again. As soon as the cart came opposite the spot, the old man rose from his lofty seat, and standing up said in a loud voice, I am the sage Lirgandeo, and without another word the cart then passed on. Behind it came another of the same form, with another aged man enthroned, who, stopping the cart, said in a voice no less solemn than that of the first, I am the sage Alquife, the great friend of Urganda the unknown, and passed on. Then another cart came by at the same pace, but the occupant of the throne was not old like the others, but a man stalwart and robust and of a forbidding countenance, who, as he came up, said in a voice far hoarser and more devilish, I am the enchanter Archelaus the mortal enemy of Amadis of Gaul and all his kindred, and then passed on. Having gone a short distance, the three carts halted, and the monotonous noise of their wheels ceased, and soon after they heard another, not noise, but sound of sweet harmonious music, of which Sancho was very glad, taking it to be a good sign. 
and said he to the duchess from whom he did not stir a step or for a single instant senora where there's music there can't be mischief nor where there are lights and it is bright said the duchess to which sancho replied fire gives light and is bright where there are bonfires as we see by those that are all round us and perhaps may burn us but music is a sign of mirth and merry-making that remains to be seen said don quixote who was listening to all that passed and he was right as is shown in the following chapter end of volume two part two chapter thirty four recording by expatriate in bangor maine